On this side of the cassette, you will hear Dr. Howard C. Eastep bring the next study in this series from Daniel. With your Bible open, please listen carefully as Dr. Eastep begins teaching from Daniel chapter 10. Open your Bibles to the book of Daniel, chapter 10. And we're going into four verses of chapter 11. Chapter 10, which is divided into five parts. Uh, the lesson outline, number one, Daniel's fourth vision. This deals with Israel in the last days, verses one through four. And number two, the vision of Messiah in verses five through six. Three, the vision and its effect upon Daniel, verses seven through 11. And four, Gabriel enters the picture, verses 12 through 14. And five, further effect on Daniel, verses 15 through 21. And then we take the first four verses in chapter 11 under the heading, Four More Kings Over Persia Before Alexander the Great, chapter 11, verses 1 through 4. Now we go back to chapter 10. We pick up the first part of our lesson, Daniel's fourth vision. It concerns Israel in the last days under Antichrist, verses 1 through 4, we're looking at verse 1, in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia. This was five years after the vision of the 70 weeks of years in chapter 9. After chapter 9, then five years later, he has another vision, chapter 10, in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a thing was revealed unto Daniel, whose name was called Belteshazzar, and the thing was true, but the time appointed was long. In other words, the time for the fulfillment was in the far distant future. The time appointed was long, and he understood the thing and had understanding of the vision, primarily because he had had Gabriel as his teacher. I'm a great advocate of a teacher. I think it's necessary that we have a teacher. Some people think, well, I don't need to go to college. I don't need to go to seminary. I don't need to go to Bible school. I'll just teach myself. It's difficult. You may eventually teach yourself, and the Holy Spirit is a supernatural teacher because Christ said that when the Holy Spirit came, he would bring to your remembrance whatsoever I have told you, indicating that Christ, the master teacher, had previously instructed the apostles and the disciples, but he said, when I go away, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will remind you what I have previously taught you. So I feel it's necessary to have a teacher. It's almost absolutely necessary to have a teacher. You'll get along much faster. And I'm constantly answering letters of young men who feel called to the ministry and they don't want to invest in three or four years in a Bible school or a seminary. And they say, well, I'm just going to take my Bible and go out and start preaching. Well, I think this accounts for a lot of error that we have being taught today in the world. And uh, it's not really fair to the individual. It's not fair to the people who are going to be taught by that person. But Daniel had a marvelous teacher as we've been studying the 7th, 8th, ninth, and now the 10th chapter. We find that Gabriel, an angel from heaven, a special angel, always came and instructed Daniel. And so we have the thing here in the latter part of verse 1, and he understood the thing and had understanding of the vision. Verse 2, in those days I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. In other words, Daniel had a long time to fast and to pray and time to think about the matter. And for, he says, Three full weeks he had been pondering this because his people, you know, are in bondage. He's wondering, when are my people going to go back to their homeland? When are they going to get back their beautiful city, Jerusalem? And so he's constantly thinking about these things. As we studied in our last lesson, we found that most of chapter 9 was given over to a prayer. 
And Daniel was reciting this prayer in chapter 9, beginning in verse 3 through verse 19, constantly begging God to forgive his people or to forgive the Jewish people of their many sins, and Daniel included himself. And so Daniel is mindful of the fact that his people are away from their homeland. They want to go back. They need to go back. When are they going back? And verse 1 tells us that he had a vision. He understood it. And the actual fulfillment of that vision was for a time appointed. And it was a long way off in the future. Verse 3 says, during this time of mourning of three full weeks... He says, I ate no pleasant bread. This is a long time for a man to fast and to pray and to be constantly emotionally upset or under a strain. I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth. He didn't eat any meat. He didn't drink any wine. You must remember that wine is part of the economy of the Jewish way of life. And those people over there drink wine for their meals, much like we have a glass of ice water for our meal. And they don't become drunkards because of it, but uh, it's part of the economy, the way they live. So we can't condemn them for it, and we have to look at the way of life, the way that they do. And so he's just mentioning here, I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth. Neither did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. He had been in a time of fasting and prayer, seeking God's will, seeking God's answer for the length of time that his people are going to be dispersed among the nations of the earth until three full weeks or whole weeks were fulfilled. And in the four and twentieth day of the first month, which would correspond to the 24th day of our April. In the fourth and 20th day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, which is Hedekel, then I lifted up mine eyes. This river, Hedekel, is the Tigris River. Over in that part of the world, you'll find that there's two rivers that come together. The Tigris and the Euphrates come together out in the gulf there. And so evidently he was beside the river Tigris, the Old Testament name Hedekel. And so as he's standing beside this river, he says in verse 5, as we pick up a vision he had of Christ, verses 5 through 6, he says, I lifted up mine eyes because during this previous three weeks he had been fasting He had been in a spiritual state of seeking the direct will and leading of God. He lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose loins were girded with fine gold of Euphaz. His body also was like the beryl, and his face as the appearance of lightning, and his eyes as lamps of fire, and his arms and his feet like in color to polished brass, and the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. Evidently, this was Messiah. God was giving him a vision of Messiah. Some men believe this was an angelic being that he saw. But if you look at uh, the book of uh, Revelation... In chapter 1, you have practically the same uh, description of Christ that John saw on the island of Patmos, a great similarity. So this is probably, most likely, a vision of Messiah recorded in Revelation 1.13. So God is giving this Old Testament prophet a vision of Messiah as he stands by the side of the river, modern river called Tigris. We move into our third part, and the vision and its effect upon Daniel. He saw this. What's the effect? What happened when he saw all of this? Well, it would be a tremendous experience to be standing on the banks of a river 
after a spiritual encounter that he had just gone through of some 21 days, and he looks and he sees this tremendous figure standing there that resembles or is parallel with the dis- description that we have of Christ. Naturally, there's going to be an effect upon him, and we pick this up in the seventh chapter through 11, and 7 says, And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. This proves that one person can see a vision, while others cannot, even though they may be present. That's rather a little difficult maybe to understand. A number of people must have been with him. He says, I alone saw the vision, for the men that were with me saw not the vision. In other words, God opened Daniel's eyes to see the vision that is recorded in verses 5 through 6, but he didn't open the eyes of the other men that were with him to see the same vision, giving a supernatural thrust to the entire occasion. Verse 8, Therefore I was left alone and saw this great vision, and there remained no strength in me. He became void of his strength, weak. He just passed out, as it were. No strength in me, for my comeliness was turned in me into corruption, and I retained no strength. He just, what we would say today in modern terminology would be that he fainted, evidently. Something happened to him inside. The strength of his body failed him, under those circumstances, as he's standing there on the banks of the Tigris River, seeing this vision up in the heavens, supposedly that of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, verse 9, yet heard I the voice of his words. This one whom he saw spoke to him, because in verse 9 he says he heard his words, and when I heard the voice of his words... Then I was in a deep sleep on my face, and my face toward the ground. That's why I said previously that I feel that he fainted. He just passed out. Verse 10, and behold, a hand touched me. A hand touched him, a man greatly beloved. Understand the words that I speak unto thee, and stand upright. I'm going to speak unto you, stand upright. Now, this, voy- this hand that touched him was not necessarily the one in the vision. Some have tried to link the one in the vision, came down and touched him, but I feel that this is a different one who is touching him here because it appears that this one is Gabriel who is touching him. As he's lying there on the ground by the banks of the Tigris, he is passed out. He's had a tremendous spiritual impact overtake him. He has fainted, and then suddenly a hand touches him, and that hand sets him upon his knees, pulls him up off of his face, upon his knees as he would be in a kneeling position to pray, and up on the palms of his hands. In other words, he's you've seen people faint, and they couldn't get up, and they're just sort of kneeling on the ground with their hands holding their face up off of the dirt. And then verse 11 says, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee, and stand upright, for unto thee am I now sent. God was always sending Gabriel to Daniel. For unto thee I am now sent. This vision is in almost every detail like that of the Son of Man in Revelation 1, 12 through 17. Gabriel is instructed by another person to make the vision known to Daniel. In other words, God wants this man, Daniel, to know something specific. So God is going to have Daniel come, or he did have him come, And he says unto him, I'm going to teach you. I'm going to reveal. I'm going to give you understanding of this matter. And when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. 
fantastic experience. I don't think any of us have ever gone through anything like this, where we have had a supernatural being encounter us as Daniel was and audibly talk to us in voices and in a message that we could comprehend and understand. And I think this is one of the reasons why he stood there trembling, shaking all over, frightened. Because this is a new episode in his life. Gabriel enters the picture. We get this now in verses 12 through 14. Then Gabriel said unto him, Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel. Daniel is standing there trembling in verse 11. So in verse 12 he says, Stop your trembling. Don't be nervous. Calm down. Relax. Listen to what I have to say. I'm not here to frighten you. I've come to help you. Verse 12. Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. In other words, here is an example of prayer being delayed. Daniel prayed earlier in our study that God would reveal these things to him. And here we are now in the 10th chapter, and the angel Gabriel is coming to reveal these mysteries to Daniel, showing that prayer is sometimes delayed. Now, we're in a, in a habit sometimes, I think, that we get into a position where we pray and we want the answer immediately. Now, sometimes we get the answer immediately. But that's not always the case. Sometimes it may take several months or even years for the answer to come. God can answer immediately. God sometimes answers our prayers almost immediately. Sometimes he answers them while we're still praying. We have New Testament record of that, and we have Old Testament record of that. Even in the life of Hezekiah, the king, the prophet had gone into his bedroom and said, set your house in order, you're going to die. And the king turned his back or his face to the wall, and he began to pray, and immediately God said to the prophet who had just passed out of the bedroom on his way out across the courtyard, go back into his bedroom and tell him that I have heard his prayers. He may have 15 more years of life. So don't get discouraged if you don't get the answer to your prayer immediately. Now, some people have said, oh, pray once. If you don't get the answer, forget about it. No, keep praying. Because the Bible says, if God hears the prayer, God will answer. So we have a case here of delayed prayer. Such delay should never hinder faith or cause one to give up seeking an answer that is promised by God. They should only urge one to renew his efforts and to hold on in prayer and faith until the answer is realized. So Gabriel said to Daniel in the latter part of verse 12, he says, For from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself, in other words, to fast and to pray, and Daniel went into sackcloth and ashes to humble himself, Chasten thyself before thy God. Thy words were heard, and I am now. I'm inserting the word now. I am now come for thy words. I've come because of your prayer. A little Jew praying a captivity of the Babylonian government on the shores of the Tigris River in what is now Iraq had an angel come down from heaven and minister to him simply because he prayed. God never changes. God's the same today, yesterday,
forever. What God did for one, God can do for somebody else. Verse 13. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me. Gabriel is given the reason for why he didn't come immediately. He said, I could have been there immediately, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me. This is the satanic prince, our ruler of the kingdom of Persia, one ruling the kingdom of Persia for Satan, who is recognized in Scripture as being the God and ruler of this world. You must remember this. Satan is the prince of this world system. Don't forget that. You can drive a stake in the ground and you can hang your hat on it and you'll never have to pull the stake up because it'll remain a marker for eternity. This world system is not of God. And the governments of this world, though we are asked or invited by God in Romans the 13th chapter verses 1 through 3 to pray for those in places of authority, yet this world system belongs to Satan. And Satan has legions of demons. And these demons function in the administration of this world system for Satan. You can't get away from that. That is a Bible fact concretely taught in Scripture. And it cannot be refuted in any way. And so Gabriel is making it plain to Daniel that the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. Daniel previously had been 21 days in prayer. And he had been beseeching God and no meat or wine had touched his uh, mouth. He hadn't eaten anything for 21 days. But during that 21 days, there was a spiritual battle going on. A tremendous spiritual battle between Gabriel and the satanic prince of the nation of Persia. Because the Persian Empire at that time encompassed what is now Iraq. Because Daniel was standing on the banks of the river what we call today Tigris, which is in Iraq, but at that time it was all Persia. And so this explains why Daniel had such a hard time. And when you're going through a spiritual battle, sometimes you get weak and weary. You get all fagged out, if you know what I mean. You just don't have any pep. You're just weary. You're just fall on the bed and drop off to sleep. You're just exhausted. Actually, what happens is spiritual virtue goes out of you. Spiritual virtue. Much like the woman when she touched the hem of the garment of Christ. A big crowd jostling one against another. And a woman touched the hem of his garment in faith in healing faith. Christ says, I perceive that virtue has gone out. Somebody touched me. So when you're having a battle with the devil and the elements that oppose you as a Christian, you're going to have a similar circumstance overtake you that overtook Daniel. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me, verse 13, one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. Too big a job for Gabriel, so God dispatches Michael, one of the chief angels, to come and help him. And I remained there with the kings of Persia. So this bears out what it says in the Bible, that there is a great spiritual war going on. If it were possible that we could take our secular glasses off, these material glasses, lay them down, and then put on spiritual glasses, we would see that this room is filled with spiritual beings. There's a great war going on. A fantastic encounter is being engaged between the forces of God and the forces of Satan in this world. 
And the prince of this world system is making a bid for every soul that he can capture for himself. That's why it's a battle to live for God. It's easy to live for the devil. You can live for the devil and not even try. You don't have to have any qualifications, nothing. Just be a no good rotten bum and you can live for the devil. But to live for God, you have to have stamina. You have to have high ideals. You have to have perspectives that will glorify God. You have to be reasonable, assured in your own heart and mind that you are a son of God, a child of God, and you want to please God in thought, word, and deed. And it's difficult to live for God. Because the forces of evil are against you. Even Gabriel says, when I would come, I couldn't make it. The prince of Persia fought against me. And it was a tough battle. I, at one time, I didn't know where I was going to win or not. But God sent reinforcements. He sent Michael to give me a hand. And says, I remained there with the kings of Persia for 21 days. Verse 14, now, at the end of the 14 days, now I am come to make thee understand what? Understand what? Here's the key. Listen carefully. I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days. This is all regarding Israel. What are you going to do with these theologians who say that Israel is all washed up? God is finished with them. The church has taken the place of Israel. Anybody that would teach that garbage shows an ignorance of the word of God. Gabriel came to Daniel and he says, I have come to make thee understand what shall fall thy people in the latter times, the latter days. Thy people. Who's he talking about? The Jews. He's talking about all the tribes. He's not talking about just the two southern tribes, Judah and Benjamin. He's talking also about the ten northern tribes who went into Assyrian captivity and came back just a short time later, a remnant of the ten, and joined themselves to the two full tribes in the south, Judah and Benjamin. And then a hundred plus years later, the two southern tribes, Judah and Benjamin, with a remnant of the ten northern, were taken into Babylonian captivity. And they're in Babylonian captivity while this is going on. All Jews, all of Israel. I've come to make thee understand what should befall thy people in the latter days, in the days just preceding the coming of the Messiah. The latter days. We're living in the latter days. The church age has been going for almost 2,000 years. It's been almost 2,000 years since Pentecost. Been almost 2,000 years since Jesus Christ said, I will establish my church or build my church or found my church or start my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Been almost 2,000 years. We're living in the latter days. You can't deny that. There's no way in the world you can deny that. And Gabriel says, I have come to make you understand what's going to happen to the Jewish people in the latter days, for yet the vision is for many days. The vision is for many days. This thing that was revealed unto you in verse 1, but the time appointed was long, that is for many days. What do we mean? The main object of the vision is to show what shall befall Israel at the end time of their oppression by the Gentiles. That's why I say that Bible prophecy is history written in advance. If you want to read history, you go to the library and you get a book or books 
on any phase of history. And there's all kinds of history. Well, when you read history, it's something that's already happened. It's passé. But when you read prophecy, it sounds like history. And that's why some men interpret the Bible from a historical position as something that has already happened because it sounds like history, but it isn't history, yet it is in a sense because prophecy is history written ahead of time. Fresher than the morning newspaper. More accurate than the morning newspaper. For yet the vision is for many days. Further effect upon Daniel is recalled in verses 15 through 21 because now he's having a tremendous encounter. As you see this man standing there on the banks of the river, he has fainted, he's passed out, he's been revived, he's brought back to life, as it were, or back to normalcy again. And lo and behold, there's an angel from heaven talking to him, revealing some things that he had in his vision. And he has to know that this is a supernatural being because Gabriel is telling him things that only Daniel knew to start with because Daniel said, the men that were with me, they didn't see the vision. But yet here comes an angel that knows all about it. So Daniel has to be persuaded in his own heart and mind, this thing is not normal. There's something supernatural about this. So it's going to have a further effect upon Daniel. And we pick that up beginning in verse 15. And when he had spoken such words unto me, when Gabriel had spoken to Daniel, I set my face toward the ground and I became dumb. He passed out again. Evidently, he needed a bottle of Geritol or something to pep him up because he's not going to do any good just passing out. He's going to have to stay on his feet or he'll never get this thing under control. So he passed out, he fell toward the ground, he became dumb, he fainted, so forth, verse 16. And behold, one like the similitude of the sons of men touched my lips. Somebody like the sons of men touched my lips. Then I opened my mouth. Now what he touched his lips with, we don't know. Someone said he gave him a drink of water. Well, supposition. Then I opened my mouth and spake and said unto him that stood before me, O my Lord, by the vision my sorrows are turned upon me, and I have retained no strength. I fainted. This is too much of an ordeal. I can't, I can't stand up under the strain of this. For how can the servant of this my Lord talk with this my Lord? For as for me, straightway there remain no strength in me, neither is there breath left in me. He's giving excuses of why he's void of his strength. He's not normal. He's weak. He's washed up, as it were. Verse 18. Then there came again and touched me one like the appearance of a man. And bear in mind that angels always appear in the form of men. So there appeared unto me one like a man, and he strengthened me. God sent an angel to strengthen him. Evidently, this is Gabriel. So God sends an angel to this weak Jew who has been through this tremendous supernatural encounter with these outer space beings. God sends an angel to strengthen him in verse 18, verse 19, and said, this angel did, O man, greatly beloved, fear not. Don't fear. Don't be upset. Peace be unto thee. Be strong. Yea, be strong. And when he had spoken unto me, I was strengthened. Isn't that amazing how God can do that? Here's a guy so weak he can't even stand up. He just falls over on the ground, fell on his face, no strength to stand up. God dispatches an angel from heaven. The angel says, stand up, be strong, be strong. Don't be afraid. You've got your strength back. And he does. He has it instantaneously. And when he had spoken unto me, I was strengthened and said, let my Lord speak, for thou hast strengthened me. You've given me back my strength. Thou hast strengthened me. Then, verse 20, said he, 
Knowest thou wherefore I come unto thee? Do you know why I have come unto you? Has it gotten through to you yet? Because he told him in 14, verse 14, I've come to make known unto you what will befall your people in the latter days. And now will I return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Greece or Grecia shall come. So what he's saying here, when I leave you, I will have another fight with the prince of Persia. He'd already fought with him for three weeks. Now he's going back to fight with him some more. Proving that there is a spiritual war going on out in the heavens that we know nothing about, absolutely. We have no way of knowing, and if we could put on those spiritual eyeglasses, we could see these things. That's why Jesus said to someone in his day, he said, uh, you don't believe me when I tell you earthly things. How are you going to believe when I tell you heavenly things? If people won't believe earthly things, how will they believe spiritual or heavenly things? And so Gabriel is going to fight the prince of Persia. And when I am gone, lo, the prince of Grecia shall come. The prince of Grecia is the satanic ruler prince of the Grecian empire that caused Alexander the Great to be so, caused, uh, to be so successful in 13 years as to destroy the Medo-Persian empire completely. The prince of Greece, the angel of Greece, the forces of Greece, the prince of this world system, said in the book of Luke to Christ, he said to Christ, fall down and worship me. The kingdoms of this world, as they passed in the panoramic view before the eyes of Christ, Satan said, I can give you all of these things because they have been given to me and I can give them to whomsoever I want to. Alexander the Great came on the world scene, took over from the Medes and the Persians, and in 13 years, he captured the whole then known world. Tremendous strategist. No military commander ever like him. And sat down on the shores of the Aegean Sea and wept, a confirmed alcoholic, because there were no more worlds to conquer. The prince of this world system, don't get entangled with him. He'll start with just a cigarette, a glass of wine, a kiss, a hug, this, that, and pretty soon you're on the skids on your way down. We move now to chapter 11. We have covered chapter 10. It only has 21 verses. We have seen that chapter 10 is actually uh, a preview of Israel in the last days under the Antichrist, setting the stage for what's going to happen in chapter 11 and then later in chapter 12. We move now to the 11th chapter. We're going to take the first four verses of chapter 11, and this is the history from Darius to future Antichrist. Verse 1, and we're looking at four more kings over Persia before Alexander the Great. And you notice that Michael said, or at least Gabriel said, that he's going to go and fight with the prince of the kingdom of Persia. Now we go to chapter 11, verse 1. Also in the first year of Darius the Mede, even I stood to confirm and to strengthen him. Daniel was called upon to strengthen the king, the rise the mead. Verse 2, and now will I show thee the truth. Behold, there shall stand up yet three kings in Persia. There shall stand up yet three kings in Persia. Three kings in Persia. And evidently he has reference to a king probably by the name of Cyrus II, who ruled from 550 to 530 B.C., referred in Esther chapter 1 and in Second Chronicles chapter 36, and Cambyses from 529 to 522 B.C., not referred to in the Old Testament at all, and Darius 
1 from 521 to 486 B.C., referred in Ezra chapter 5 and 6. The fourth king is either Xerxes 1, 486, 465 B.C. of Ezra 4, verse 6, or Artaxerxes of 465, 424 B.C. of Ezra 7, 11 through 26. But here we have, it says in verse 2, Behold, there shall stand up yet three kings in Persia, and the fourth shall be far richer than they all. The latter part of verse 2, And by his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Grisha. And a mighty king shall stand up that shall rule with great dominion. So he's evidently, in verse 3, and a mighty king shall stand up, that shall rule with great dominion, and do according to his will. And this is generally agreed among Bible scholars and historians that this is Alexander the Great who carried out the plans of his father Philip to invade the Persian Empire. The war began in 336. 6 B.C. when Alexander came to the throne of Greece. He had only 35,000 soldiers and $75,000 to start the war with, while the Persian king had a yearly revenue of more than $11 million in the treasury and hundreds of thousands of soldiers besides a great navy. So here's little, little Alexander, King Alexander coming on the scene with just a small budget of 35,000 soldiers, and he's going to oppose another king who has many millions of dollars in a budget, in the treasury, and many soldiers, great navy, and how's he going to win? Satan. You see, Satan sets up kings and Satan puts down kings, but God permits it. God permits it because everything is in according to the directive or the permissive will of God. And God allows difficult times to come upon a country and the inhabitants of that country suffer untold hardships because of their sins. And when this Persian empire became so pagan worship enthralled, God allowed another kingdom to take over, and this accounts for the momentous achievements of this young general by the name of King Alexander of Greece, who in only 13 years conquered the then known world. Verse 3, and a mighty king shall stand up that shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. And when he shall stand up, King Alexander of Greece took over from the Medes and the Persians. And when he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken. In other words, he'll come to the end of his kingdom. His kingdom shall be broken and shall be divided toward the four winds of heaven. And as we've said in previous lessons, when Alexander died, his kingdom went to four of his generals. Out of those four generalships evolved Syria, Turkey, Greece, Egypt. This is all ancient history. Notice verse 4. And when he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken and shall be divided toward the four winds of heaven and not to his posterity, not to his people. This simply means that Alexander's kingdom was to be divided among others who were not of his posterity, not according to the dominion by which he ruled. And so his kingdom was divided among four generals, it eventually evolved into the four countries I mentioned a few moments ago, fulfilling prophecy. Now, you can go to the library and you can get a book on ancient Grecian history and you can read this from the secular standpoint. But we have been reading it tonight from the 
prophetic standpoint. And you must remember that this was given to Daniel about, and this is round figures, approximately 530, 535 B.C. That's almost 2,500 years ago. You have heard Dr. Estep deliver the 10th message in this Bible study from the book of Daniel. Please listen to the next cassette tape for the completion of the study of Daniel.